not fear. Fear is the mind killer. Fear is the little death that brings total obliteration. And today's a good day. Hello, it's episode 13 of Rangers Radio. It's the 14th of September 2017. We've got a slightly shorter show for you today. Uh, it's just me at the helm here. But uh, the discussion will be with Avagdu, who some of you will know from the early days of Rangers Radio. If not, you can go back and listen to chats with him. They're all available on the archive.org. And Avagdu is the guy that did Storm the Wire. So if you want to check out visuals on him and what he's up to, or what he was up to, because uh, the Storm the Wire is a reissue, um, go along to the Storm the Wire playlist and check out. We're slowly uploading seasons two and three because he wasn't very happy with the quality of season one. But, you know, it's out there on the archive.org if you want to go check it out. So we're going to go straight into the news. Um, not much tech news this week, but a lot of like kind of political news. So a reboot of the government's rehabilitation revolution, including early release of well-behaved prisoners, could free up more than 7,000 prison places, according to the latest report from a centre-right think tank. So fascists have been thinking about prisons. The Centre for Social Justice report by former prisoner and Conservative Cam Cabinet Minister Jonathan Aitken um, and a retired judge, John Samuels QC, that says despite the rehabilitation revolution having been championed by two former Home Secretaries, five former Justice Secretaries and a previous Prime Minister, both offending rates and the prison population have remained stubbornly high. The scale of the prison crisis was underlined this week by the official pay review body, which recommended a 1.7% pay rise for prison officers, and it said staff motivation, morale, confidence in the prison service were undoubtedly very low, with assaults and other forms of violence in jails at their highest level since 2000 and rising. Or 2000, comma, and rising. Um, the report for the Centre for Social Justice which was founded by Ian Duncan Smith, published on Thursday, calls for a 10-point programme to resuscitate the drive to cut re-offending rates, including a limited program of executive release to reduce prison numbers. The measures advocated by Aitken and Samuels could reduce the prison population in England and Wales from a record 86,000 and potentially save £246 million a year. And they include, and this is why this is in the news story, freeing up 3,300 prison places by avoiding unnecessary recalls to prison of released inmates, which is probably a good thing and releasing 2,500 of the 3,200 prisoners serving indefinite imprisonment for public protection, IPP, sentences whose tariffs have expired and can be re released relatively easily, quickly and safely. I've got a little bit of problem with that because somebody serving an indefinite imprisonment for public protection obviously means they're a violent offender and you could possibly be releasing those and if it's the sort of person that's a violent offender, likely they have people that you know were kept safe from them so i'd want a lot more oversight in that um, a program of ex executive release overseen by a small number of authorized judges beginning with 500 ipp prisoners have already served longer than the maximum fixed sentence that would otherwise be imposed for their offense other categories would include those whose age and incapacity render them no longer suitable to be in prison who pose a minimal risk to the public so this is like people that were going to be like you know career violent criminals and they're just too old to be looked after by the prison system, which means that they're not really saving any money. They're just shifting it around because those people will need health care and, you know, other benefits and stuff like that in order to live in the outside world. The next point is reducing the historically high number of 21,559 offenders recalled to prison in 2016, most of whom were recalled for minor breaches by introducing judicial oversight. This could free up 3,300 prison places occupied by recall prisoners. Again, that depends on what sort of crime they've been recalled for. If they're, you know, sort of like, you know, people that would beat their spouses or anything like that, I'd want to make sure that, you know, those people when, you know, had a, a huge degree of oversight um, before they were released, possibly to go after the people that put them in prison. And creating four pilot US-style problem-solving courts to tackle drug and alcohol addictions of 3% of serial offenders who account for 40% of the crime. Which is good, you know, just... You know, help those people if, they're, if they've got a problem, but also keep the people, you know, they're obviously in prison because they've done something like theft or violence or anything like that to support their habits. But, you know, depends. Again, I don't want to see loads of violent prisoners out on the streets looking for the people that, you know, the re they think are the reason that they're there. And improving the number, pay and training of prison officers so they can use their skills in the rehabilitative, rehabilitation program and addressing futures of the failures of the remodeled probation service. 
No, 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 no. But I mean, this is interesting, and the reason I'm one of the other reasons I'm putting it in there because it compares really interestingly with the American system, where prisons are privatized and there's a GDP boost to putting someone in prison. If someone's unemployed and they're put in prison, that actually boosts the GDP slightly. You know, because more money's been spent on them, there's a company that's making profit out of them being there, stuff like that. This is why privatised prisons is not a good idea. So our government, because it has to pay for prisons, is interested in reducing the number of prisoners, which is great. You could easily reduce the number of prisoners by, you know, not putting so many cannabis offenders in there. That would be good. And the CSJ report finally says that successive governments have failed to live up to their bold promise of rehabilitative criminal justice reform. Although some small steps towards this rehabilitative revolution have been started, there has been little significant progress. Instead, they note the government's myopic and almost exclusionary emphasis on prison security following the increase in numbers of suicides and assaults. The rehabilitation revolution requires a reboot, the political and public consensus that the rehabilitation is a vital and necessary part of an effective criminal justice system remains intact and the government will seek to return this ambition into reality. But also, you know, make sure that um, people aren't tempted to reoffend. get them qualified to do stuff. You know, get, you know, government contracts picked up by, you know, ex-prisoners, you know, so if you've got local authorities that need stuff doing, you know, the local authority gets a preferential rate if it uses companies that employ ex-prisoners, you know, non-violent prisoners and stuff, who will go in and be electricians or plumbers or general stuff like that. Give people a chance to get educated themselves, provide some sort of online university courses, or at least an access course so those people can go to university once their sentence is complete and study something so that they can be a useful member of society. I mean, I think, you know, some of the very best people to do certain things like drug and alcohol counseling like um counseling inside prison like um i don't know all sorts of stuff where you know people you know the the fact that somebody has been in prison serves as a reality check and their advice is therefore more valuable there's all sorts of things that ex prisoners could do there's all sorts of things that anybody can do i mean that open education should be available for everybody in every language anyway rant over but that's that's interesting. It was an interesting comparison that, you know, we're trying to reduce our prison population where America seems to be wanting to increase it. Anyway, next up, a judge has ordered the jailing of ex-pharmaceutical chief executive Martin Farmer Bro Shkreli while he wait, awaits sentencing for security frauds. Judge Kyo Masumoto said a Facebook post in which Shkreli, S-H-K-R-E-L-I, Shkreli, offered $5,000 dollars for a strand of Hillary Clinton's hair showed he was a danger to the public. The former CEO had been free free on five million dollar bail since his 2015 arrest. Shkreli was branded the most hated man in America when his firm hiked the price of medication for AIDS patients. In August 2017 he was found guilty of three counts of security frauds by a New York City jury which cleared him on five other counts. Shkreli was on trial in relation to a drug company he previously headed, Retrofin, and a hedge fund that he managed. On Wednesday, Judge Masamoto ruled that Shkreli's post on 4th of September, made shortly before Ms. Cl Ms. Clinton, Mrs. Clinton began a book tour, showed he posed a danger, rejecting arguments his words were protected by US free speech laws. Shkreli, who has, flash, who has clashed frequently with critics on social media, had argued that he, the since-deleted post an, amounted to satire and had been a, re a reference to DNA sequencing. This is a solicitation of assault in exchange for money, the judge said, that is not predicted, protected by the First Amendment. Shkreli's lawyer Benjamin Braffman said, We are obviously disappointed. We believe that the court arrived at the wrong decision, but she's the judge, and right now um, we will have to live with this decision. Shkreli, who is now facing up to 20 years in prison following his fraud conviction last month, will now be placed in custody ahead of his sentencing hearing, which has been scheduled for January. Shkreli rocked a notoriety in 2015 and earned the nickname Pharma Bro after raising the price of life-saving antiparasitic drug called Daraprim by 5,000% on acquiring rights to the medication. Overnight, the price of the drug soared from $13.50 to $750 per dose. So yeah, the guy's a scumbag. Yes, he called for something on social media. Yes, he created a target out of himself. But um, uh, someone being a dick on the internet you know, no, but there again, he has that kind of money where offering $5,000 could cause someone to assault Hillary Clinton, especially the sort of people that, you know, 
are likely to think, oh, well, yes, I'll go after that $5,000. I mean, it's a sort of like mining people's poverty in order to make a point. And I think if somebody had gone after that and had tried to go for that bounty for a strand of Hillary Clinton's hair, uh, I think she could have got hurt or the people around her could have got hurt. So, yes, it's one of these free speech things where you think, yeah, that was a stupid thing to do. Um, but I guess if you're about to, you know, face 20 years in jail for securities fraud and you've got the kind of money where you are a flight risk, hence the huge bail amount, um, I think that uh, you really shouldn't be pissing people off or, or, or advocating harm to other people on the Internet. So there you go. Your mileage may vary, your ideas may vary. Or you can always respond to what I've said or my opinions on it by contacting me at v4v at earthling.net or uh, just leaving a comment below the YouTube thing. Anyway, and finally, um, on our short show this week, members of the Australian National Rugby Union team have disagreed on Twitter over same-sex marriage as the country prepares to vote on the issue. The spat came after 28-year-old player Israel Folo posted on Wednesday that he opposes same-sex marriage in a tweet that liked almost 3,000 times. The Wallaby player's comment was made the day after postal ballots were sent to voters in Australia for a non-binding vote on legalising same-sex marriage. That's interesting. A non-binding vote. This is where a government asks the opinion of the general public and then has a think about it before they act on it. Unlike the UK government which goes, should we leave the EU and screw everybody over and cause our eco economy to basically tank? and all our human rights to go out the window as soon as a government comes along that wants to wipe them out and we'll 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 treat that as binding so look this is this is an important issue the government are asking the public's opinion there is a referendum and they'll think about it once it comes in anyway another rant over wallabies coach michael chaker and captain michael hooper met with politicians earlier this week to show their support for the proposed legislation after sp other sporting organizations are calling including Australian Rugby Union, Cricket Australia and the Football Federation Australia, also voiced their support for a yes vote. A poll released on Tuesday and reported by Australian media suggested amongst those certain to vote, 70% said they planned to vote yes. Others weighed in on Mr Folau Street. Nobody's asking you to marry a man. A yes vote shows respect to others who want the right to have their relationship treated equally, commented Deputy, Mo Deputy Lord Mayor of Sydney, Karen Phillips. So the Australians are finally voting on same-sex marriage. It's not like a, a, a fantastically homo homophobic country, no more than, say, the US. But, you know, equal rights mean equality. So, you know, just Australia can go up in the world's estimation. I mean, there was a whole thing about it um, with... Who was it? It was over in Australia. It was... I think it was George Carlin... Or someone like that who just said, you know, you're better than this Australia. Anyway, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's an interesting thing. So those are our three news stories. Have a think about those. The links are in the running order, which can be downloaded from archive.org. And there'll be a link underneath this YouTube video if you want to download the running order, which kind of acts as a little newspaper. All the links are live, so it makes it easier to go and track down stuff we've talked about on the show. Now, um, we're coming into our halftime music, which will be Pure Phase Ensemble 4, um, recorded live at Space Vet. Space Fest, and the track is Morning Rise, and as usual, this is courtesy of Shamus Promotions Records, after which is a sort of Quo Vardis chat, as in where are we going from here, with Vagdu, who was one of the very first people uh, that we got sort of like together with across the pond in uh, on the Rangers thing. So we basically um, spent two or three hours talking about what, what we want to do with the base that we have and how we want to progress um, Rangers Radio across. Okay, and thank you uh, in advance um, for listening to the show. Um, after the discussion, after the halftime music, we'll come back for some links and recomedia. And uh, yeah, we'll do that.
Okay. There we go. Yeah. One button. Yeah. Oh, you, the, the hassle it used to be. Really. <laughs> yeah. Like they used to be literally, I kid you not, on this on the Rangers radio show when we first started it, because it was all clutched together and because it fell over so often, there were sometimes four computers running just to get one Skype mix. And yeah, I remember you saying something about three computers running in an attic or something. Yeah. <laughs> and in the summer, they'd overheat. It, uh -huh. would just, it would just die. It was a mad room to look at. I mean, this is pretty mad. I mean, if, if you can imagine a room about 20 feet by about 18 feet, and one wall's got a full DJ mixing bay next to a really massive desk, which has its own story, and then at a right angle to that, the, the studio starts, and there's two chairs and a, and, a, and a table. So the room is like just jammed. It kind of looks like a, re like a really seedy porn studio. <laughs> Um, what else was I going to say? Uh, yeah. Hello to the internet. <laughs> Hello, internet. Um, <clears throat> yeah, you can like cut this up and throw an intro on it if you want on it and use it as a segment on, on Rangers radio. If, if, uh, if there's too much dead air <laughs> yeah, or something, but whatever. Oh, it's me. There's never <laughs> I don't do dead air. I, it really does absolutely make conversations a bit difficult. <laughs> and I just realized why I talk so much when I talk to people. Part of it is because, you know, I spend a lot of time on my own and with my own thoughts. So when there are people, it's like, I've had all these ideas. I must tell you them so you can remember them because I will forget. I didn't write it down. <laughs> well, that's, that's a good thing. <clears throat> so why are we here? Yeah. Well... I've not long finished work. Um, you were online. <laughs> if you're talking about this evening, or if you think, yes, is it, that's an adjustable question. Why are we here? Okay. Well, I'm not trying to be existential on you or yeah. anything. There's the existential <laughs> answer. There's the right now answer, and there's the general <laughs> rangers answer. So, so the rangers thing is still happening. Ran is still kind of happening. We need to. We need to. We need to get the wogs back. <laughs> Yeah, rent kind of needs a uh, adrenaline shot at this point. Yeah, and where that? Oh, I thought of a really funny um, trailer for for <laughs> new increased ranges output, and I really will have to make sure that I've got a load of stuff ready to go. So it looks like we're we're really pushing stuff out. So I'm going to record loads. I'm going to get loads of video. Out. I've got two or three interesting chunks of stuff, and I'm going to really try and put out about half an hour of media a week video, and at least an hour a week audio. Nice. Sort of a really fantastic. You know that bit in Aliens where they all get onto the APC and uh, Hudson just starts in on one and just goes, Don't worry, Ripley, me and my squad of ultimate badasses will protect you. Yes. Partable, partable, partable beam phalanx. Whoosh. Pick out city with this puppy. We got knives, sharp sticks, harsh language. And he just goes into a mad rant. If we just did that to Sim. Just in camera to Sim, wearing a lot of camouflage. Don't worry, Sim. Me and my squad of ultimate Ranger badasses will protect you and give you new content. We got Rangers TV, Rangers Radio. We got Scratch Vine. We got all kinds of shit. We got knives, sharp sticks, product reviews. Tacular nukes. We got everything. <laughs> got neurogas. Yeah. We got napalm. We got small cats. <laughs> Got all kinds of clickbait for your ass now. Yeah. We'll just cut to black. <laughs> the only funniest thing is every single person that watches it will will get it. No explanation needed. They'll just totally be in the rhythm of it wondering where it's gonna go. It's like eight seconds or, or fifteen seconds of just mad rant into the camera and they're just rang the Rangers logo. Nice. <laughs> and then I, I like it. Really hitting out with the media and just like totally changing it, and just and then getting loads of loads of the uh, rank crew on. I bet we could get Sim on the show. <laughs> it's a winner. Mm. And it would be funny as anything to do. But so just really dressed uh, up in, in your most ra in your most wog like <laughs> attire, just into camera like right face filling the frame 
I've got I've got a beret as well. I'm gonna put. Oh on yeah, my, dude! Put, I've, I've got to put on my webbing camouflage jacket, <laughs> just like holding a cookery. It's all right, the, Sean. The, we the question you, you have to ask me is, is do you want me to wear the body armor or the chest rig? I mean, that's the hard question. Everything yeah. else is easy. <laughs> I got the helmet. Yeah. I got the Marpat. I got everything. Don't worry. It's covered. Got my EDC, got my car bag, got my work bag, got my bug out bag, got my stay home bag. Got I got my... too many fucking bags. I got so many <laughs> bags. I got bags in storage now. Yeah. I got bags <laughs> stored in bags because there's so many bags. <laughs> Damn. Yeah. Yeah. So we went off for like six hours uh, last, well, was it last week? I don't know. It was a few days ago. Week. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, uh, out of that mad rambling, we came up with an idea for a, or you came up with the idea for a, a chat show, um, kind of like, you know, uh, a Johnny Carson sit down guest show where we'd have a discussion about a particular relevant topic. And the twist was the um, Max Headroom type. Uh, video display so we could have virtual guests. Yeah. So. Because the technology is finally here that we can do that and we can do that reasonably stably. Yeah. <clears throat> so I, I predict lots of technical problems, but <laughs> when it works, it will be brilliant. And that's the story of the British military experience in the world just forever. You can, <laughs> when it works, it's awesome. <laughs> but there will be technical difficulties because <laughs> English people are doing it. So, we'll do so it. your plans for cool. the studio? I don't think we got that on on oh. the recording yet. Oh, the studio's done. Madly. But I mean, as as far as the uh, the accoutrements. Oh yeah, definitely. I think the studio needs to get madder and madder and madder as the show goes on. <laughs> so it's gonna it's gonna start with like camo backdrops and people sitting in chairs and the lighting sorted and the sound sorted. I mean, you may you it may be that you'll see the microphones just so we can get it loud enough because all the oh, microphones yeah. are ones that are designed kind of for podcasting, so they're kind of close up. But we do have microphone stands, so that's not an issue. So you might see them. We might eventually go to Laval Lavalier microphones if we can get ones that work. Yeah. You don't even need to do that. I mean, that's totally doable. Yeah. You know, the the, the sockets on the um, field recorder are modular sockets. So you can plug Lavalier, you know, on extension cables. Yeah. You can plug them right in. So we may get to a point, because I have two. I've got two lav mics. So it may get to a point where the mics just become invisible. Or is, or is less visible as possible. <laughs> yeah. Imagine recording the show on throat mics. <laughs> Sub vocalizers. <laughs> It'll sound like where where the uh, the, the anti smoking ad. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think it'll be really really good. And, uh, we'll just record it like that. It'd just be mad, wouldn't it? I, I wanted mics. to get one of those for my cell phone a long long time ago. Yeah. Well, they, <laughs> the, the Balfour ones are about seven quid. You can get those. Those just plug into the Balfour radios. There. Awesome. Yeah. You know, but uh, yeah. I bet you yeah, know, well, I mean, it wouldn't be much to adapt a, a two and a half millimeter microphone to a three and a half mil cable. You could do it. Yeah, I just I I watched uh, Tears of the Sun and I got all you know excited about throat mics. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, absolutely. I bet you could have fun with your airsoft team if you just went into a town centre, had your throat mics covered up. And then coordinated following someone just with the throat mics. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I bet that could be handy. Or you okay. could just walk into town with your fatigues on and camo face paint and freak everyone out. Yeah. <laughs> what I wanted to do was, if we got really good at airsofting, just go down to those rubber knives. Yeah. How upsetting would that be? If all these oh, people wow. turn up packing all yeah. kinds of hardware. And like a team of six guys just turn up with face paint on and all that sort of shit. Just with the rubber knives. That would be hardcore. Where, yeah. where are your guns, guys? Don't need guns. <laughs> what, what do you mean you don't need guns? 
Well, I've seen The Hunted about 300 times. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that was the scariest thing I'd ever fucking seen. Yeah. <laughs> just imagine, sort of like you're, you're crouched down, you're, you're, you're pinging away at people, and you just hear off in the woods, what you do has no honor. <laughs> 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 you just... You would just shit yourself. Like, Shink. No. Yeah. <laughs> My knife against your rifles. <laughs> Fuck no. Everybody running out of the droves of people just fleeing the woods. Fuck no. No, crazy people are in the... And there'd just be a megaphone come up. Could the crazy people please come out of the fire zone? <laughs> We'd like a word. That would just be hilarious. With the funniest, scariest fucking thing. You definitely need to be wearing body cams for that. Yeah. Because it wouldn't matter if you got shot to shit. Any kill that you got would just be fucking brilliant television. Yeah. <laughs> just nice. Just the most scary fucking thing. I mean, do you remember that um, um, Ponage? That, that show that was also mm. on Rant TV? When mm -hmm. you just ran around being fucking crazy in first person view. With yeah. Because it makes you run faster. That would just be like that, but writ large. With just like loads of sort of like, you know, let's be honest, fairly pudgy people. <laughs> terrified, turning around, looking at you all terrified. You know, just loads and loads of shots like that. That would be the funniest airsoft game ever. It would be so funny if you got it onto those airsoft channels. People in Germany would pay for you to go airsofting. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, we, we will pay for your flights. It would be most entertaining to see the people with the knives just running through five kilometers of heavily armed airsofters. Um, it will be like the Werner Herzog documentary we saw last week. <laughs> wow, they, yeah, you'd be celebrities overnight. These guys just carry fucking rubber knives. And, and they tend to win. <laughs> when, are they, when are they doing it next? Fuck, I'm, I want to go. I, I don't mind if I'm a victim. It will be fun to be a victim. If someone can take me out with a knife in an airsoft game, I will be so impressed. But just these guys just popping up out of nowhere. Yeah. Like, boom, taking people down. It's like, this is fucking crazy. There's like zillions of BBs flying everywhere. People panic firing all over the place. Smoke grenades going off, flashbangs and shit. People really panicking. Because like, you know, the Alpha team with the knives has suddenly shown up. Alpha team, we're in the compound. Fuck! Full auto! Ah! <laughs> Spraying rounds around, hoping to hit one of them. And just from behind, someone just going, very wise. Slash. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, table just went fucking terrifying yeah so speaking of winning i have uh i have come to the conclusion after a couple of chats with with you v and with my significant other and uh just with myself thinking about the state of the world and that there there's a problem right now when when rangers and rant radio and things like that can have such lofty goals and be good be have done it for a decade now that uh the churches and the cults are winning at least to some degree and i think the problem that the reason why they're winning is because um, we've refused to take any compensation for what we do. Yeah. And I think that, um, you know, if, if some, if some uh, religious cult like uh, the Church Universal and Triumphant, like I mentioned before, nobody's ever heard of them. They've got a very small following. They were able to build a $25 million shelter large enough to drive several semi trucks through. Yeah. And so. <laughs> Why don't we have that? We, <laughs> yes. We want that. <laughs> we need to do something. We're doing something wrong. Uh, yeah. Because, you know, they were, they were able to do that, build that whole thing in a few years you know with with a membership you know uh think about um i just watched a documentary on om Sharikio. like they were able to build a multi-million dollar organization 
in about eight years. Yeah. They what are we doing wrong? Out. They bought so much land in Australia <laughs> that they were able to detonate what they now think is a nuclear weapon in Australia <laughs> without anybody finding out for about four years. <laughs> I mean, you've got to mm. fuck off. Really? Some guys that believe the end of the world was coming at the millennium and they were going to all, you know, just kill as many people as possible and stuff like that and believe that they needed to purify the earth from all the decadence. Yeah. These people bought like 50,000 acres in Australia and a new. Yeah. And all we want to do is hang out and do cool and a shit. Soviet attack helicopter. Yeah. And develop sarin and. See, we don't even want that. <laughs> we just want somewhere we can just go, you know what? I'm going to go to the Rant Stroke Rangers compound for a couple of weeks and just get my head together. And we want if, a couple if, acres of land. If, and if I don't want to come back, that's okay too. They'll find something for me to do and be getting on with. If I just think, fuck it, you know what? No. You know, why can't we build a really nice self sufficient community out somewhere? I mean, hippies and shit managed it. Yeah. Quakers manage it. <laughs> Not. Yeah. Like, why aren't well adjusted Robert Heinlein reading funky dudes going and doing that? Yeah. Why, why aren't people that uh, are, are knowledgeable with. Uh, with cryptocurrency and uh, counter economy and things like that, building this stuff when uh, on the the Mennonites are beating us. I mean, yeah. Jesus Christ! Yeah. The Amish have us beaten at yeah. this stage, and we've had a decade. Like, yeah. So we need to do something. I think that once you got into a, once you got one or two up and running, there is like a there seems to be. I mean, I've I've heard of it. I don't. I'm not saying every Asian person in the UK does this. But when you've got a big Asian family and someone's getting married, they can buy them a house. Mm -hmm. So on that thing, given that there are so many people that are into this, like in the millions, there's, you know, there's a few, I mean, there are lots of bushcraft channels out there. There's lots of people doing videos on prepping and just being comfortable somewhere and all that. There's loads of them. There's loads of them in the UK that do it. You know, there's loads of them in America that just sort of go, you know what, if I could just go somewhere where people weren't out and out racist rednecks, but like to hang out and, and fuck about with guns and explosives and do media and just, just generally have a whale of a time. Because I bet if you had like 50 people in a community, you could probably do almost full-time television out of that. Okay, well, let's, let's talk numbers for a second because... Um... I know that over here in the states, we've got at least, at least half a dozen hardcore guys, like guys who've got everything sorted from the EDC to the bug out bag to the ultimate uh, alternative transportation to you know. Uh, they've learned how to grow crops. They've learned how to grow plants. They know what they would grow if they had to grow it. Yeah, we've got at least we've got at least half a dozen hardcore guys. And I'm sure that you've got at least half a dozen hardcore guys over there. Am I right? If there was a place, say, I don't know, 50 acres, that was running as a farm, that was off the grid, that was self-sufficient, um, and that was basically producing content or things to, to generate money, yeah? Yeah. If that was there, I could fill it with 50 people. I could get 50 people there. Mm -hmm. without a shadow of a doubt, without any doubt in my mind, with that there, I could fill it. And have things like holiday bunkers for people to just go, right, I've had enough. And yeah, yeah, come over, man. Hang out. When I like your idea that you brought up about uh, um, <clears throat> kind of turning it into a training aspect, because the training aspect could be kind of, if you wanted it to, if you wanted some degree of separation mm. you could have the training aspect kind of be the front the the face the public face of the organization yeah, if you ran it as a school. the pri the private face would be you know the rangers the public yeah. face would be you know the training mm. and that way you we could earn an income through the training and not have to cannibalize our funds from the rangers themselves yeah see what i'm saying yeah so if you get a place together and start generating money through training, then you can you can basically do what aristocrats have been doing for the, for as long as people can remember, is you buy more land. 
in mm-hmm. a different location. You 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 basically franchise it out. Yeah. I mean, maybe that's where we're going wrong. I mean, McDonald's went from nothing to what? It's 1960 odd. Mm-hmm. In 50 odd years, there isn't a town or a city that doesn't have McDonald's in it, almost worldwide. Because they went into real estate. Yeah. That's <laughs> maybe what we should do. Yeah. <laughs> Generate an income off the real estate to buy more real estate in order to, you know, maybe even become a landowner, as in buy houses. Mm hmm. You know, buy places. Buy places that, might, like, you know, if there was that much money sloshing around, buy blocks of flats. Yeah. With one flat, the most secure flat in the building is held over for, like, a safe house. And what I, the, what I was talking to, uh, to Brie about, my, um, my significant other through um, other people on the radio might not know. Anyways, uh, what, I, what I was talking about with her is that my, my, my initial idea um, to do over here in the States, which may or may not be correlated to what you guys are doing over there in the UK, but uh, what I would do is I would buy as big a chunk of the land as I could afford, and it wouldn't really have to be that big, like a small parcel that you could fit four to six houses on. You know, uh, with still, you know, room with back for backyards and, and such like that. Yeah. Anyway, buy that land, build a house on that land, a small house, a, a tiny house, put a trailer on it, whatever. It doesn't really matter. Do that. Okay. Yeah. Then I don't know how the monetary arrangement would be, whether it would be renting or communal or how we would arrange it, but somehow. I would get people that think like us over there. Yeah. So, uh, you know, if 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 I had no other source of income, maybe I'd be renting these parcels of land. I don't know, but basically, we'd get other people that want to be off grid over there. And oh, you know, if you could advertise it right, if if there was somewhere <clears> where I could go for a week. And live in an off-grid home, surrounded by chickens and plants and all that sort of shit growing, and learn new skills, and be taught how to rig up a 12-volt solar panel, and get electricity up and running, do shit like that. Like, post-apocalyptic shit. Mm-hmm. So, you know, with car batteries and solar panels and stuff, you know, your, your first... So, at least you're going away better prepared. A bit of first aid. Mm-hmm. Maybe a bit of bushcrafting, fire lighting, prepping that sort of thing, how to preserve food. You know, all the sorts of things that you can teach people without, like, handing them a loaded gun. Mm -hmm. You know, get rabbits in, you know, show people how to kill a rabbit and a chicken and stuff like that. Because having having done it, for me, is always way better. Yeah. You know, and maybe, you know, maybe teach them about using a radio, you know, what works with a radio and stuff like that, communications. And, and do like weird little bits of training courses like that, but you get a few people over to come camping and they get to learn all that. I think then that you're, you'd, you'd be generating some serious money in the summer. Because I'd jump at that. Oh, right. It's probably me moving the microphone. <laughs> Is that better? Yeah. Um, uh,. Yeah, but well, basically, what I was thinking is, okay, so if you've if you've got you know four to six people that are all content on being off grid, mm-hmm. okay, so there'd be a lot of learning at first, but all the learn all the uh, what is it like the commodity goods or whatever, like you know uh, twelve volt batteries or or whatever like that. I mean, essentially, after enough trial and error among the groups, you'd get that pretty much standardized. You know, oh, well, some, you of learn- the, some of the people I'd invite to live there would be um, already can grow stuff, already can look after chickens, you know, raise bees, yeah. you know, do the electricity, wire 12, 12 volt solar panels in, all that sort of shit, and would yeah. be happy to live like that. So once you've got... Uh, um, that part's sorted out. Pretty much the only thing left is food production, right? Yeah. And so once you've 
once you get everybody working on food production, eventually you're going to make more food than you can eat. Yeah. So that way you have kind of an economy going. Hmm. You've you've built an economy yeah, and that economy value surplus to what you actually require. Yes, and that economy could be uh just among those four to six people, eight people, whatever, or it could branch out and and be something that you, you know, let the flatlanders, the city people in, you know, to sell them your chickens or your eggs or mm. your meat or whatever. Just depending on your you know, your morals but, and values and but if you look at so the attendance forth. of something like the bushcraft <clears throat> Yeah, the the amount of people that go to that is like sort of seven or eight thousand in this country mm -hmm. that actually travel to a different part of the country to attend a show that's got lectures. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the amount of stuff you can then do, you know, once yeah. you've got it functions. I mean, even if you just made documentaries and did YouTube show, YouTube show about building it and doing it and having it up and running, uh, or and then you converted that into a DVD. If people mm -hmm. came and stayed and learned stuff, I guarantee you they'd want the DVD or the book. Yeah. Because if I went somewhere like that and they, and you know, somebody said to me, "Oh, you know what? We did a book and it's full of pictures and diagrams and shit of how we did it. Um, it's available in electronic format for like five bucks, mm -hmm. uh, or it's in hardback for say fifteen or twenty bucks. But most of that you understand is getting it produced." And then mm -hmm. there is, you know, there is this DVD of us doing it. So everything you've learned while you've been here is available on DVD. Yeah, and once you get that, like, you can you can replicate it under generally the same conditions, which means we'd be helping everybody all over the country just by having these four to six to eight people, you know, Already doing, doing it. it. Yeah. Yeah, but the ability to sort of go, you know what? Oh, they've said like, if you want to come along, it's this. I don't know. I don't know what you charge. They say, look, you know, it's I don't know, two hundred quid to come mm -hmm. for a week. You mm -hmm. can stay in one of the Earth Earth ships or whatever sort of housing we all, we end up organising. You can muck in, and if there's anything you want to learn, go and hang out with the relevant person. Mm -hmm. Literally, if you want to know how to keep bees. The beekeeper is doing keeping bees right now. So put on a beekeeper suit and go with them while they go and get the honey. Yeah, and they'll tell you anything you want to know. And there's also a, I don't know, a video on beekeeping, like a year's mm. worth of beekeeping, everything you need to know. Yeah, you know, if you want well, to learn and... about the radio that we've got, where we talk to the guys that have got a similar thing in America, we hook up with them like once a day because it's part of our security comms. Yeah. You know, so if anything goes down, we can at least let them know that it's going down, or they can let us know if something's going down. Exactly. So we've got comms with other people on different ends of the planet. I mean, imagine if Kim got, if uh, Harlequin got something sorted out like that. Yeah. And managed to sort one out in Australia. That we've got basically, you know, the world covered. The right. Exactly. That goes all the way around the world at all times of the day and night. Exactly. Um, what I've noticed is there's kind of. What's great about this, um, what I was kind of mentioning before, is that it's kind of exponential. Like, if I've got a bug out bag that I know can I can survive out of for four days, right? Yeah. That's just because I can't carry more food and water than that. Mm -hmm. Okay, I could I could stay out of it. I know if I can stay out of it for four days, I know I could stay out of it for two weeks. Mm -hmm. If I know that I can uh live out of my truck for f for four weeks i know that i can live out of my truck for four months if i know i can live out of my truck for four months i know i can live out of my truck for a year yeah or two years you know bearing food and water that's the only mm. you know if you've if you've done it for a certain amount of days where you've you've developed okay like this is how many times how long can i go without a resupply yeah how, you know, how do I get, do my basic daily hygiene and my d basic sanitation needs and all that kind of stuff. Once I get that sorted, like once that's sorted, you know, it's pretty much just a matter of food and water resupply. 
Yeah, and, and if, you and can if I've continue. got the bushcraft skills to back it up, and I've got a truck, the tools that I need to build something, and the, the knowledge and you know the understanding of how stuff works, I can survive like a 16th century person for the rest of my life. Yeah, and I should say also, uh, uh, along with food and water, you probably need fuel also. So you're probably going to need you know resupply on on gas and propane. And uh, maybe uh, resupply on on uh, electricity every once in a while. Did you but see if... that um, that little thing that looks like a tiny greenhouse? That's essentially a promether. No, that you put your kit... it's basically a compost bin. Oh, okay, okay. And it produces fertilizer when you water it. Okay. But the offshoot of that is also produces methane. Nice. In enough quantity. To be able to, for you to burn a single gas ring for two hours a day. Okay. Yeah. Once it's going. Mm -hmm. That would be useful. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Why don't we get two? It's like, you know, it's one <laughs> yeah. of those things where you look at it and go, I want two. How much are they? It doesn't matter how much they are. Right. It's a bit like those Edison batteries. Have you seen those? Those mad 12 volt batteries that are fully dischargeable and are, and are guaranteed to last for 50 years. No, I haven't heard of those. They're about, they're expensive. But, you know, once you've got some solar panels and as long as nothing happens to those or you've got a few spares, that's electricity done. Mm -hmm. I mean, Elon Musk is working on the power wall and they're currently installing them in Australia. Um, which is basically a mad batch of Tesla batteries. And they're, they're proper deep cycle. They last for a very long time. You can recharge those a lot. And uh, that's just linked into solar panels and enough solar panels on each roof. So you can do everything you need to just off the solar panels at any time while the sun's out. But any any um, what's any sort of amps that you don't use just get fed into the batteries. Mm -hmm. And it's at such a degree of technology now that you don't notice that you're not on mains electricity. Wow. You know, people in australia they've got they've got the uh they've got mains for backup but largely they're just living straight off these battery walls and solar panels for electricity you couple that with being able to have gas to cook on mm -hmm. or, e or even induction hobs if your yeah. solar power is that good right you know but i'd want a backup i mean I'd probably have a wood burning stove with cooking right. plates on it so if you have to go real primitive real fast you're already prepped for that so yeah. I know that uh, that my sustainability out with the truck is uh, is two weeks, and that includes uh, a calculation for propane to uh, have a shower that um, I'm in the process of putting together. Um, I need to acquire all the parts for it, but I know it could theoretically be done meaning that i could have um a shower as long as i take right now at least three times a week if i rationed the water i could have it i could have or if i rationed or reused the water i could have it all week mm. um and the uh, <clears throat> the uh, electricity to run a laptop <clears throat> A few hours a day hmm. so with those two things if I didn't want to use, if I didn't want to shower and I didn't want to get in contact with everybody via the internet or whatever or, or use my laptop to edit videos or, or whatever it is uh, then the two-week limit would be lifted and it would just be as much food and water as I can carry hmm. um, but I know I can do that. Yeah. So it's just a matter of uh, of expanding out from there. Hmm. But if you if you knew you had a little bit of land that you could go to that had, say, a stream on it, and mm -hmm. you had a cargo container on that land with tools and useful stuff in it. Yeah. You know, sort of like a couple of rolls of um, polythene. So you can build a polytunnel, load of heirloom seeds, you know, a water storage tank, 
that you could just pull out and set up next to the cargo container if you should then suddenly need it. Yeah, I was thinking about what it would take to bury a, a water storage container out in the middle of the national forest somewhere. Mm. <laughs> so I could go longer without resupply. Yeah. You know, sort of like once you've got a piece of land and it's got like a cargo container on it with all the useful stuff in, your resupply time goes up to a couple of years. Yeah. If you've really thought about it. You know, with things like nails, screws, lumber, hand tools. So you just go, right, I'm just going to get on with it. You know. A couple of a, a good felling axe. I, mean, I don't know if you've seen that Dick Pernicky alone in the wilderness. I went on um, years and years ago. Is that the warble one that we talked about before? Oh, or is that one, a different one? No, it's the it's the one where the guy goes out into to Alaska and demonstrates how little you. Oh, the live. the really old guy. Yeah, yeah I, re I remember you talking about that on Rangers Radio, but I don't. Um, I haven't seen that video in a long time. And they literally dropped him off at this lake in Alaska. There's no road to it at all. There's no. The only way in and out is by seaplane, because the, the only place the plane can land is on the water. Mm -hmm. So the seaplane drops him off with absolutely everything he needed, including a film camera and enough film for him to shoot the whole bit. Yeah. And he just builds a log cabin. For the first couple of days, he stays at a friend's log cabin that's about half a mile away. Uh huh. And he just chops down all the trees and builds the whole log cabin with about five tools. Uh huh. Because it's just like, it's just doing stuff for about all hand two tools, weeks. too. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's, I know, just, I just saw that and thought, yeah. And if you could have a cargo container of everything that you might find useful, you'd have had it done in a heartbeat. You know, you'd you'd have just got all that done and just gone right. I'm just chilling out now. I'm just going to go fishing regularly. As stuff comes into season, I'll process and preserve it. But largely, if I fuck anything of that up, I'm still good. I'm going to go on a little bit of rant here, because <laughs> on all these on all these shows and and some of this like research material I found, I found all these people that are, go out in the woods and they and they obsess over and they think it's such a big deal and 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 worry about it and it takes up you know 80 percent of their time every day is like coming up with a good shelter i don't know why this is hard like if your shelter doesn't work if you can't if you can't throw up a tarp or a tent and you can't uh get under it and stay there for two weeks, then something's wrong with it. Like yeah, it's def I, I, it's defective, you know. Yeah. If and if you can't build a better shelter in two weeks, then you've got a serious problem. Yeah, I mean, I, you see that on um, the Bear Grylls Island all the time. Oh, we've got to build a shelter, and then they piss around for like weeks. Yeah, trying to get that shit sorted out, and you look at them going, "No, seriously, it, it's a bit like the Royal Navy engine officers exam." Uh -huh. There's a bit in the exam where the exam sort of find out whether you can be I don't, I don't know what an ensign in the Royal Navy when, before they let you on a ship when you're going through officer training school is they 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 give you these two um, chief petty officers and they're standing there and you've got an eight foot tall chain link fence and two barrels and some plank and some ropes and you're supposed to get the barrels over the fence you know without dropping them you know without just p picking them up and heaving them over. Mm -hmm. And you fail the moment you say anything other than to the chief petty officers, do you know how to do this? <laughs> do you know how to do this? Yes, sir. We do it every week. Every week, <laughs> one of you midshipmen comes up to us and, we, and we, we, he gives us all these instructions on how to get it over. So you can remember the way that you can get it over in as little fuss as possible. And they go, yes. And you go, carry on and walk the fuck away. <laughs> now if you're somewhere where you've got an island you've got 10 random people and you want to build a shelter and you say does anybody know how to build a shelter like, has anybody built a shelter before mm -hmm. and yet, then that person puts their hand up and you just go do what he says <laughs> how do yeah. we build this shelter and you, you basically say you basically find the best people for that job right now yep and you don't fuck around after that, you just do as they say. 
someone there's an architect and you say right we're gonna have a conf lab we're gonna have 10 minutes of conf lab and then we're gonna have a plan and then when the plan's in place the person that actually does building will be in charge and we will do that plan we will just fucking do it yeah you know unless somebody goes does anybody do if, if it's down to does anybody do bushcrafting at that point when there isn't someone that's an architect and can see what we can do what we can and can't do with the materials down if you get then down to bushcrafting then the bushcraft guy goes right okay the easiest thing to do is build a shed load of these lean tos all facing in towards the fire mm -hmm. so that the lean tos themselves act as a reflector so it'll be really fucking warm if there's a fire on yeah you know we'll build them about six feet out so if you want to get off and we'll, you make sure that your platform gets you as close to the fire as you want to be. We've got loads of wood. We're allowed to chop it all down. There's loads of easy to chop down shit like bamboo and stuff. Okay, so we need maybe... So we need... You know, because if you have more than, say, six, then you're too far away from the fire. So we'll try, we'll try and build a thing that encompasses a dozen of us with two fires. And then we only need about five people to build those today and build us a raised bed so we can sleep on it. We want another bunch of people to grab soft material for the mattresses and keep doing that until we've got them. We need another bunch of people to go and get fucking coconuts. We need a couple of people fishing and we need a couple of people gathering firewood. And that's what we're doing for the day. Well, and you've got people that they have food stores, they have food reserves, or they've at least got fat reserves, mm -hmm. okay? And then they, and they wait for weeks before they build a good shelter. Yeah. All the while, every single Burning night, they're shivering to death. calories a night, just staying alive. Yeah, exactly. You can't afford exactly. it. Get on with it now. <laughs> now, don't sit down and eat a fucking movie bar <coughs> and tell me about the shelter you'd like to build. Get off it now. Right yeah, now. it drives me nuts. Get off the fucking ground. <coughs> yep. Sorry for that. Yeah, no, I know. It's, 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 it's a big thing with me. It's like radios. You know, are you in a small group trying to survive radios right now, as soon as you can find them? Yeah. <laughs> What's our priority? Shelter. Uh -huh. Number one. Shelter, then water, then food. Yep. <laughs> I think we, I think we had a discussion about about the priority of those um, a few years ago, and now it's uh, we don't we don't need to discuss it anymore. We know exactly what, what that yeah. order is because we've done it enough times. Yeah, we've been out there. We've done it. <laughs> First thing you do, you hit dirt, you put your tarp up because at any moment, especially in England and where you where you've lived historically, when you were living in Washington. Mm -hmm. You know, if you'd hit dirt in Washington State in one of the parks, shelter. Because it'll fucking yeah. rain. If you don't, it'll rain. And there are, not only will you be wet, so you'll be burning more calories in order to stay conscious, but also all your shit will be wet. Yep. All the stuff you've carefully packed will be exposed to the elements unnecessarily when all you needed to do was spend two minutes stringing a line between two trees and putting a fucking tarp up. Well, even if and, it doesn't that, rain, you might need shade too. Yeah, <clears throat> that... That came, absolutely came in to effect um, when we were walking Hadrian's Wall. Because we got to the end of the second day. We came to this village and fortunately someone in the village said we were thinking about actually paying money and, and camping somewhere. But there was a guy in the village and as we were walking down he, he said to the first group of people by the way there's a little place down by the river over there that loads of people just camp in. You might as well camp there. So we walked down off this little stone bridge along this little bit of woodland along the river and there was a perfect campsite that had a river going past it so we could refill all our water filters. So we arrived there and went, oh, this is brilliant. So I immediately said, right, I'm, ham I'm putting my hammock and tarp up. Yeah. And it was early evening. And, they said, and I spent a good sort of like 20 minutes putting all that up, got my hammock up, got all my gear out of the, ra out of the way. It wasn't raining. It was a beautiful sunny day. And one person just literally... Put, laid their bivy bag down on the ground and went I'm good oh. in a kind of I've got ready for all of you and then in the middle of the night it threw it down Yeah. and that guy was <laughs> fucked because he couldn't be bothered to put up a tarp yeah. all his stuff was wet he was the guy that dropped out oh. you know it basically reduced his morale so much that he'd have to get up at 2 o'clock in the morning and put a tarp up after his stuff was already wet yeah it's just like that's why I don't do that 
if you're gonna if you're gonna have a bivy, you gotta at least yeah you gotta have at least uh some large contractor trash bags to to cover the rest of your gear up Mm. but when me and dean went to wales we it took a lot longer there to get there than expected because he was late setting off so we got there in the pitch dark we met the guy bless him he was really mellow about it. he said yeah you can still set up it's down there past there over there and we got into a place and literally it was so nice to be with someone that five minutes after we picked somewhere all our stuff was up like there were two tarps up two hammocks all our gear was stowed away and there was a fire going yeah in like five minutes because of the place <laughs> that we picked in in the dark local knowledge helps well no we'd never been there before but he but the guy knew that that showed you that's what i'm saying oh right yeah <clears throat> but the guy at the campsite in wales literally the ca- the actual place where we could camp was about a quarter of a mile away from where we parked the car mm-hmm. and it was dark <laughs> oh okay hit the woods found a place that had trees far enough apart that we could just about squeeze our hammocks and tarps up into but we picked somewhere that was so covered in dead wood that we just like aced it i mean i got my i get i tend to get my stuff up a little faster than dean so i then went and got the firewood and got the fire going it was just like yeah we it's not even a contest with nature now and why is the why is everyone on the alone show nobody's taking a fucking hammock Mm. every season they go this ground is so uneven i can't find a camping spot where am i gonna pitch my tarp where am i gonna build my shelter their own pack (laughs) yeah fuck <laughs> so, oh, we uh, need to be on that. I'm not a hammock camper, but if I was on a ground like that, I'd bring a fucking hammock. <laughs> it's just a rolled up strip of cloth. Yeah. It doesn't take up a match room in your pack. Oh, I'll tell you what, <laughs> Dean and everybody was really pissed off when they saw I had my hammock. I got two <laughs> nights hammock camping walking Hadrian's Wall. And they're going, oh, it's all lumpy and all I've got is a tarp. It's like, well, I figured carrying an extra half a pound of equipment that meant I didn't have to sleep on the fucking ground was a great idea. Yep. And I got I got to use it twice. And the thing is, the great thing about hammocks, which is why I think everybody should learn to hammock camp, is that when somebody sees a tent, they get a, they have a different reaction to when they see a hammock. Yeah. Because they've been conditioned to think survival expert hammock. Mm-hmm. And there's a reason for that. Because it's a good fucking idea to be off the ground. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a great idea. You don't get bugs in your sleeping bag, for one. If it rains, you're already up and next to your shelter material. You're right close to it. You know, and, you know, you just get a better night's sleep. And well, and, and most people have bad takes... associations with tents because they think of it as a nuisance when they see a tent. Hmm. When they see a hammock in this country, they think, oh, Ray Mears. Yeah. So I've managed to camp on people's land and they've just come by and go, oh, that's all interesting. And you sort of give them a quick tour. And just like, yeah. You know, and also a hammock with um, mountain carabiners attached to it so that you can clip it to your ridge line and get it out of the way during the day. Yeah. You can just literally clip it to the line and, and tie it up out of the way with a prissing knot. So you've got all that workspace. You've got all that space to store, to, to store wood or things that you're gathering and all your kit. And if it is raining, you can sit under it. And also, if it's raining, there's nothing more comfortable than using your hammock as a chair. I mean, it has to be said, it's a bit dangerously comfortable because you're disinclined to get out of it if it is raining. Because <laughs> you're just like, no, I'm comfy. It's, it's easily the most comfy thing. I know people that were in the army that have never slept in a hammock. I know just a bloody amazed when they sit in one finally. You go, no, sit in it. It takes a little getting used to. I'm going to have to take a short break here for a second. Okay, man. All right. Okay, so here's the links and Wrecker Media. 
that we've got uh, coming out to you. You know, just interesting places and bits of video on the internet you can check out that I've found over the past week. Okay, so first up we've got a YouTube video from uh, H3H3 Productions. Not everybody's famous, sorry, favourite uh, YouTube channel, but this is interesting. It is interesting to see how people are unlike, unwilling to learn new stuff, which uh, I know this isn't a problem for all the everybody that's listening to us, for all the Ranger listeners out there, and we're interested in new challenges. But it's interesting to see how someone butts up against uh, a new operating system. And this was about a girl who's not going to college because Ubuntu is too hard to use or replace. But it's interesting. It's only two years old, so the technology hasn't really changed in any radical way, and Ubuntu is um, still a powerful operating system. We're using it to do this show right now, and I use it almost exclusively. So that's an interesting watch. I mean, I, I don't believe in hating on this person, but I think it's quite interesting that um, a new operating system can completely throw someone and, you know, people are largely unwilling to learn. Anyway, that done. And uh, following that, there's a short video from the BBC um, about, tra about transvestites for Germany, a party that's trying to bring a left-wing voice to Germany's elections. Which is really interesting that a whole bunch of people are actually forming a party, which uh, we'll go into another time. But yeah, it's an interesting thing. And uh, Avagdu gave us uh, the last Bastille podcast, which is worth a, worth a listen to. And the Vonu podcast, which were two links that he sent to us at v4v at earthling.net. And if you've got Recomedia, drop it over to us and we'll put it on the show. And uh, there's a very funny tool comparison, uh, thanks to Paonia. Um, which was about a, a, a chap basically building a machete for himself as opposed to the machete he was using. Um, and I found this whole feature-length documentary about a computer game called Polybius, um, which is a really, really weird watch. I don't want to tell you too much about it, but if you're interested in gaming and you're interested in conspiracy theories, this is one to, to, to totally check out. And finally, this week, um, Blackstone. I watched this in four days last week. It's a five-season, 39-episode TV series made by, shot by, acted by, written by First Nations people in Canada. And it's about a political um, crime story taking place on a fictional Canadian First Nations reserve. And it was awesome. If you're at all a fan of The Wire or you're a fan of anything like that, go and check it out. It's on Netflix, but I have had a quick look around and it is available on all your usual um, off-brand, shall we say, um, streaming channels. And uh, that's about it. Thank you very much for listening. Um, and uh, finally, our outro music is Pure Phase Ensemble 4 again, live at Space Fest again. And the track is called Happy Dancing Woman and it's courtesy of Shameless Promotions. Thank you very much and uh, we'll be back next week. Uh, well, uh, next week's episode also has the second part of the chat with Avagdu, the whole Quo Vardis thing. And then we'll be back to uh, other discussions. Hopefully you could be on there. So all you need to do is get in touch at the email address and uh, yeah, we'll set something up. Anyway, take care and look after yourselves.
Hey, thanks for everybody who came Thank you. Thank you so Step in avoiding a trap is knowing of its existence.